Welcome to Wine Time Mysteries, where we talk about true crime, the paranormal, mysteries, and cryptozoology with a dash of comedy. This podcast contains adult themes and is intended for mature audiences only. Don't forget to click follow and tickle that little notification bell. Now, find a comfy spot. We're about to start today's episode. What are you shaking your head at me for? Because you're about to tell me something and then you're like, oh no, fuck it, I'm just going to press record. Yeah. And tell me. Well, that's what we're here for. Maybe now, yeah. Well, it was more so that I hope that uh, this is not someone that you have decided to do before because today we will find ourselves in Australia and I haven't (gasps) done an Australian case yet. Who are you? I know. Get out. Who are you? I'm cutting your black and grass, bitch. I'm excited. Today, Mung Beans. We're going to be talking about William McDonald. I don't know if you're aware of him. You might be. I had the name down and hadn't looked into him. Okay, good. Delete him off your yeah. list. <laughs> Go on. He's getting done to die. <laughs> Born Allen Ginsberg in Liverpool, England on June 17th, 1924... He's a Gemini. Mm. And although he was born in the UK, he would soon dawn the title of Australia's first true serial killer. Get out. Oh, that's exciting. I don't have a lot of detail about his early years other than that he had a couple of siblings and that they were all poor, blah, 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 blah. The first thing I could see that was, I guess, of note uh, was that he was enlisted in the army as a teenager serving in the Lancashire... Lancashire. <laughs> Serving in the Lancashire Fusiliers. Fusiliers. <laughs> Fusiliers. And I'm just sitting here going, yeah. Well, I know that British people hate us saying Lancashire. That's how I was like, yeah, Lancashire. <laughs> yeah, so it's Lancashire. Lancashire Fusiliers, whatever, fuck my hole. During service, he would allege to be the victim of rape perpetrated by a corporal in an air raid shelter. I found a couple of different accounts on how this affected him. On one hand, you learnt that this rape traumatised him for the rest of his life. On the other, it played on his mind for years until he realised that he rather enjoyed the experience. Apparently, it was upon this realisation that he discovered he was a homosexual and would engage in sexual activity like public sex in like public toilets and pub bathrooms. Mm, you do you, go. No. <laughs> Flat out going to a public bathroom, let alone getting it on in a public bathroom. Yeah, I wouldn't even go and use them for their intended purpose. Yeah, no. Unless I'm literally about to poo my pants. I think I'd rather shit my pants. Okay. <laughs> The wrong. <laughs> After being discharged in 1947, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and was committed to an asylum where he would stay for three months. I couldn't find out the reason for his discharge from the military, but judging by this diagnosis, I would say it's reasonable to assume that it was a medical discharge. Discharge. Mucus. <laughs> Substances. You're in the one. Bandage. You don't have a vagina, okay? <laughs> Makes me sick. Mm. Makes me think of a well, story. Well, maybe my bussy has a little <laughs> bit of discharge. <laughs> Others would call it a cream pie, but I just... He immigrated to Canada in 1949. He immigrated to Canada in 1949 and then to Australia in 1955, where he would change his name to William MacDonald. He was 30 by this time. Apparently, he also used the alias Alan Brennan, among others before this. And I'm not sure entirely why he felt the need to do so, but perhaps it was for evasion purposes. But I'm just speculating that because I don't actually know. Mm. He found a job in Adelaide as a railway worker, but would soon be arrested after touching a detective's penis in a public toilet. Pause. Okay, I have something to say. (laughs) I have some anger when it comes to this kind of stuff. And please don't assume that I am in any way, shape or form trying to defend McDonald at all. I can promise you that I'm not. I have an issue with someone going undercover for the sole purpose of enticing someone into a sexual liaison to then charge and arrest them for that exact thing. No, I don't necessarily condone cruising or sex in public places, but the issue here is that a bunch of bigoted straight men wanted a way to discriminate against gay men under the guise of legality, so they sat around and figured out some stupid kind of form of entrapment and it is just beyond me that they thought this was the most appropriate cause of action. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. It makes me a little mad. Perhaps if they spent less time thinking about gay men, which I think is kind of gay, if you are 
ask me, they could have spent time trying to prevent rapes and murders, but that's just a thought. Side note, if you or our listeners want me to do an episode on LGBTQIA plus in Australia, please let me know and I will do so because for Christ's sake, it is a mess. <laughs> Play. By 1961, MacDonald had made his way to Sydney where he got a job as a mail sorter for the postal service under the assumed name Alan Edward Brennan and resided in East Sydney. He was apparently well known in the parks and public toilets because obviously he was doing like Anyway, I guess odd habits died hard, but also it was common for gay men during this time because it was made part of Australian law up until 1994 that gay sex was punishable by law. The last reform being Tasmania. Don't quote me on that, but that's what I believe anyway. Again, if you want an episode on this kind of stuff, you just let me know. It's a little bit political in nature, but I will oblige. Anyway. Well, I fucking will. Fuck, I think I need to. Because I'm it's very annoying. Mm-hmm. Fuck it. But it was from... Like 15, like year 15, I don't know, 70 something, where the Commonwealth introduced a thing called the Buggery Law, which basically, <clears throat> I have a lot of feelings about it. So this, it, it, this is not on my notes, but let me just say. <laughs> So if they discovered that anybody in public, witnessed or unwitnessed, even behind closed doors, was accused of sodomy, they could be put to death for the accusation. And that went up for many, many years. Here's the thing. This law only targeted men. It, it, there was no ramifications for being a lesbian. That, that's what I was just about. Uh, uh. In any of these anti-gay laws. Because lesbians are all right, remember? Well, because lesbians don't have a penis where they can penetrate And straight other. men can go, oh, fuck. Yeah, well, I think it's because of the straight men getting off on the idea. Why would they stop that? So yeah, again, please let me know if there's something you want to do. There's not something I want to do because it's fucking annoying. Mm. Most men are men. Most men are fucking men. Mm. Most men and men. Anyway, McDonald would take a trip up to Brisbane in May of that same year. So we're in 61, right? Where he would meet and befriend Amos Hurst, aged 55. He met Hurst outside of the Roma Street Transit Center and the two went for a bevy at a local pub. They ended up heading back to her apartment where they continued drinking because, hey, I've just met this really cool guy. We have a fair bit in common. Let's hang out. McDonald waited until Hurst was sufficiently intoxicated before deciding to strangle him. Out of the blue. To me, it was really strange because he didn't really have anything leading up to that. It wasn't like he committed a couple of assaults. Yeah, or, like the petty kind of. Or rapes or or anything like that. He went straight to I'm just gonna kill this guy. And I still don't know why. Hmm. Apparently, Hurst was so drunk that he didn't even realize that he was being strangled and eventually started to hemorrhage, bleeding from his mouth onto McDonald's hands. Because of this, McDonald punched him in the face, which resulted in Hurst dying. Like, I can kill you, but how dare you bleed on me? Mm. How dare you? Just you wait. McDonald then put Hurst to bed, removing his shoes and trousers, pulled the sheet over his head and tucked him in on all sides. He sat with him for a moment before turning the lights off and leaving. Five days later, McDonald would see Hurst's name in the paper, but was relieved when the coroners listed it as a natural death caused by heart attack. <sighs> Don't even get me started. There's a couple of things the coroners and everything did at this. Listen. I also understand that it's the 60s, but the, uh, were the coroners, were they blind? And this is not against blind people. I love blind people. But were they, were they, were they even looking at what they're doing? Are they just going, oh, he's gay, so we're just going to go, oh, hold attack. As far oh, as, as far as I'm what? aware, none of the people that he ends up murdering are gay. Of course, that's How like speculation, we- but... How long has this coroner been working for? What the hell? Just you wait. Heart attack. There's another one worse than that. Well, apparently he may have actually had an underlying heart condition anyway. Obviously, he was relieved upon seeing that article because he was in the clear. Yeah. Getting away with his first murder, McDonald didn't wait long before finding his next victim. He met Alfred Greenfield. 41, at a park bench across from the St. Vincent's Hospital in Darlinghurst. McDonald offered him a drink and lured him to a different location under the pretext of more alcohol. After getting to the Domain Baths, which I I don't know if we call public pools baths in Brisbane. I don't think we do, no. but I think they'd call them that in 
or specific ones in New South Wales, maybe. Mm. But I was like, baths. Baths. What the fuck? What the fuck? I think it's public pools. I believe they drank some more and McDonald waited for Greenfield to fall asleep. Trigger warning. He would then stab him with such ferocity that it severed the arteries in his neck. McDonald then pulled Greenfield's pants and underwear down before severing his testicles and penis, shortly thereafter throwing them in the Sydney Harbour. I don't have balls, but I just held on to them. <gasps> on the 4th of June, 1961, Alfred Greenfield's naked body was found at the Sydney Domain Baths with approximately 30 stab wounds and missing his genitalia. I would say that this next one happened a short time after, but unfortunately they have not listed any dates anywhere. Anywhere. I looked high, I looked low. I looked everywhere you could go. That rhymed. Yeah. I could <laughs> not find dates anywhere for this next victim. So I'm going to assume that it was either in the later end of 61 or in early 62. Because again, no dates. And it seems not to me because they have details of what took place other than that. Either way, McDonald was walking down South Dowling Street one evening where he met William Coben, 55. He lured Coben to Moore Park where the two drank beer in the toilets. Seems kind of strange to me, but perhaps they didn't want to be caught drinking in public because I'm not sure if open vessel rules still applied at that particular time. They probably did, I don't know. Or was this just a part of McDonald's plan so that it was kind of easier for what comes next? McDonald put on a plastic raincoat, if that's not suspicious enough already. I'm not sure how he would have explained this to Coben at all, uh, or if it was even raining at the time, but in hindsight, we can kind of guess why, but I can't help but wonder what Coben was thinking. If he was even thinking like, maybe he was sufficiently inebriated mm. and he wasn't really thinking much at all. Mm. However, McDonald's urge to kill had now escalated to the point that he could no longer wait for his victim to fall asleep. Using an uppercut motion, McDonald struck Coben in the neck, severing his jugular vein. Because of the vein he hit, blood splattered onto McDonald's hands, arms, face, and raincoat. It is reported that Coben tried to defend himself during the attack by raising his arms, but McDonald repeatedly stabbed Coben even after he had passed away. And just like Greenfield, he removed Coben's pants and his underwear before severing his genitalia. But this time, he put them in a plastic bag along with a knife and took them home, apparently cleaning the blood off him on his way. So I don't know where he did that. Because mm. again, I don't even know if it was raining. Biggest fear, finding a body in public bathroom. Biggest fear, just finding a body full stop, point blank. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know what I would do. I don't know what I would do. I don't. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I, I don't. I would need counseling. His handiwork meant that this knife was now in need of replacing. So McDonald went to Mick Simmons Sports Store on March 31st, 1962, to buy a new knife. Yeah. No, he did. That evening, he left the Oxford Hotel in Darlinghurst. Now, I'm not sure if he was staying there. It didn't say. Or if there was a bar that he was drinking at. But again, it didn't say. So I just have to assume that he had a house. So he may have just been drinking at the bar. Because it does sound like he did enjoy a little bit of a drink. Upon leaving the bar, he spotted one Frank McLean, 36, and followed him down Burke Street and past the local police station. Anyway, McDonald would start a conversation with McLean, which would again include the invitation for a drink somewhere nearby. McLean was led by McDonald a short way around the corner into Burke Lane. As the two entered Burke Lane, McDonald stabbed McLean in the throat, and while he too tried to defend himself, he was too drunk to do so. McDonald then stabbed him in the face, followed by a punch, making him lose balance, falling on the ground. McDonald then proceeded to stab him around the head, neck, throat, face, chest, belly, and abdomen. Areas. The attack was interrupted, however, when he heard nearby voices and a baby crying, so he decided to hide. Mm. They discovered McLean severely injured but still breathing and ran to the police to get help. After MacDonald heard them leave, he returned to McLean and dragged his body further into the lane where he continued stabbing him before pulling down his pants and underwear and severing his genitalia and putting them in a bag and taking them home where he would apparently dispose of them the next 
day. That's really, like, to pull him into the lane. You don't know the cop's coming. And just keep going. Yeah, that's really... Mm. But you have enough sense of self to hide when you hear the people. Mm. And how quickly did you do this? There was a theory that, well, at least at the time, that the perp was a surgeon. They believed that this attack was done by someone with years of surgical training. Like I said, so dumb. They didn't have... To, they Where was... Poirot. Where was Poirot when they needed him? Where was Agatha Christie? Yeah. Where was she? Or F- Ms. Fisher. Fisher, what is that Australian one? Fisher lady, whatever. She- where were they? Not fucking here. Not there. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, it was so dumb, it led them to investigate local doctors because they were like, it must be a doctor who's hacking at these people. <laughs> It was a very annoying case to do. Yeah, I can't tell. What the fuck? MacDonald would soon lose his job at the Postal Service and be evicted by his landlord. So he decided that he would open his own store in Burwood. And in the store, he would sell sandwiches and random small goods residing in the unit above the store. And apparently this was kind of part of his plan to avoid getting caught because it meant that he could kind of lure men into the store, kill him and take them upstairs or lure them upstairs and kill him. And on the evening of June 6th, McDonald went out for a drink. And while he was at a wine saloon is what they called it. So they must have still called them saloons. He met Patrick James Hackett. 42. Hackett had not long been released from prison and was referred to as a thief and a derelict. Do you feel sometimes they do that to kind of lessen the crime? Mm. Like when there are prostitutes and stuff. I was just about to say what it's a hook at. She was a prostitute. She was, she put herself in that situation. Oh, that's okay then. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like Mm. sometimes I feel like they do that. Just to help the people. Well, I mean, they've obviously got a serial killer. Mm-hmm. McDonald invited him back to his new residence to continue drinking. This time, McDonald waited for his victim to fall asleep before getting out a boning knife, one that he used downstairs to make sandwiches for people, and stabbed Hackett in the neck. The knife was so sharp that it went right through and it woke Hackett up, who then tried to shield himself against the following blow. But upon doing this, he forced the knife into McDonald's other hand, causing him to come so quite severely. This obviously enraged McDonald, who then unleashed on Hackett and dove the knife so deep into his chest that it went through his heart, killing him instantly. Mm. But did this stop this hot white rage that McDonald was experiencing? No, he kept stabbing him. And the only time he would actually stop was when he was so tired that he had to catch his breath again. Mm-mm. The knife, however, was now blunt from the attack, and while trying to sever Hackett's genitals, he ended up giving up as the knife couldn't make it the whole way through. Tired and unwilling to go downstairs to get a new knife, he literally lay down beside the dead man in his blood and went to sleep. He went to sleep! Okay. Oh, I'm so exhausted. Mm. Waking up the next day, he did his best to clean up, but then became paranoid about getting caught because the blood pulled up so much that it dripped through the floorboards onto the counter in the store. Mm. So his paranoia obviously got the best of him. So what he decided to do, the best course of action, hide the body under the floorboards and then flee. (laughs) I'm not laughing at the guy dying or being hit under the floorboards. I'm laughing at this dickhead. I I can't. I actually can't. So smart. Anyway, where would he go? To Brisbane. He fled to Brisbane. It would be roughly three weeks later when people would complain about a foul stench coming from the shop owned by McDonald. Upon discovery of the body, it was so badly decomposed that they were unable to make an identity. The only thing that could be determined from the autopsy was that the victim was in their 40s, making them believe that it was the body of the shop owner, Alan Brennan, aka William McDonald. Again, coroners. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? There's, there's a man that lives here. Hmm. There's a man on the floor. That's him. Case closed. <laughs> they didn't list anything as suspicious. Mm. They didn't list any damage to the genitalia. They didn't list any stab wounds. They didn't list 
anything, I, mm. a notice was put in the obituary about him, which was seen by his old co-workers at the postal service who did their own little memorial service for him. Around this time, McDonald moved from Brisbane to New Zealand as he was still paranoid that the police would still be looking for him even though they thought he was dead. This man is dumb. His urge to kill was coming back, however, but for some reason, the only place that he could do this was in Sydney, so he had to return there to do so. Smart. <laughs> I just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't. I do not. I'm glad I didn't have to research this. this I is do just... not. I do not understand. <laughs> I object, Your Honor. Hearsay. Stupidity. <laughs> so he didn't even know that this other per- <sighs> Anyway, whatever. He returned to Sydney because he couldn't kill anyone else anywhere else. He needed to do it there. Get this. While he was in Sydney, he bumped into one of his old co-workers, John McCarthy, who had attended his memorial service. And obviously this guy thought that he had seen a fucking ghost. <laughs> Dumb. So- <gasps> you're, you're so triggered, I love it. I am. I am. <laughs> They went for a drink together, however, where McCarthy explained what had happened. Turns out, McDonald wasn't even aware that he was misidentified and identified as dead because he never read the newspaper. I guess also on top of that, though, he would have been in New Zealand. I don't know where, but they probably wouldn't get that news, especially in the 60s. Like mm. McCarthy then asked him, if it wasn't your body under the floorboards, then whose body was I? And he didn't stick around to answer the question. McDonald bolted from the bar and fled to Melbourne. Yeet! Yeah. <laughs> he didn't even try. You gotta go. Yeah, he didn't even try to come up with the story. He's like, "You got me, gal," and ran. Was that over there? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. As would anyone else, McCarthy went straight to the police, but they didn't believe him and accused him of having too much to drink. He went back the next day when he was sober and they still said, nah, mate, you're off your rocker. You're off your rocker. Ugh. He kept trying to tell them and they wouldn't believe him. So McCarthy figured that the only way that he could get somebody to listen was to report it to the Daily Mirror. And he spoke to a reporter named Joe Morris. And long story short, they found the story credible and ran the story under the title Case of the Walking Corpse, a legitimate article in the paper. See, that's what reporting should be. But they're like, you're not doing your job. Let's We're going to fix it. Yeah. yeah. This forced the police department's hand into exhuming the body and taking fingerprints, revealing the true identity. They confirmed that it was their ex-prisoner. It also wasn't until this time that they saw stab wounds and mutilation to the genitals. This case <laughs> is trying my every patience. Oh, didn't notice that before. Oh, a bit of finger. What? Yeah. Must have happened post mortem when he was buried. Fucking, 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 fucking. Oh. But they can determine whether something happened peri mortem or post mortem by looking at the body. And whose job is it to do that? Coroners. Who didn't do that? The coroners. It is, <laughs> I. Uh, <sighs> was it like a kid in a, like standing on top of another kid? Like, I do business. Maybe. Or maybe it was a junior. I don't know. It makes me angry. That I don't know. still alive. Probably not. You're an embarrassment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> an identikit picture was provided of McDonald and circulated in every newspaper. By this time, he had found a job in Melbourne Railways. And even though he dyed his hair black and grew a moustache. They'll never know. They will <laughs> never know. I'm a different man. <laughs> He turned into Borat. Yeah. <laughs> he actually did. He was still recognized by his workmates and he was arrested when he tried to pick up a paycheck. Because yeah, I grew... That's like the Clark Kent fucking glasses on Superman. You can't recognize me. <laughs> fucking hell. I don't even know how... 
it got on as long. Anyway, he was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences with the strong recommendation of never being released. McDonald had served so long that he was institutionalized as he was now certified as insane. He was New South Wales' longest continuous serving inmate, passing away on May 12th of 2015 at the ripe old age of 90 of a gastrointestinal blockage. Suck shit. <laughs> well, kind of in this yeah. case. <laughs> there are some bits I left out due to lack of information around the claim, such as some members of the jury fainting when they heard what McDonald had done with the severed genitals once he returned home. But there was no reference to what he actually did or what happened, and this court document doesn't exist anywhere. Anyway, because there was no reference to what he actually did, it would just be speculation. We could assume he ate it. We could assume he did something sexual with it. So I decided that I would just use this as an example. So what did you think of today's case? Please let us know by dropping us a line. Our link tree can be found on our Insta bio. Be kind, don't kill. Thoughts on the story? I just can't. I'm surprised he wasn't sexual. Well, you know what I mean. You More so with the, with the victims. Body. Yeah. Well, well, we don't know. Again, because they didn't really talk about it. We don't know if he was, but just waited to do things with the body parts once he got home. Mm. So he, he still could have been, just in a different way. But this stuff only happened between 1961 and 1962. Imagine if he wasn't caught. Mm. I'm, I am surprised though with his bloodlust as strong as what it sounds like that there weren't more victims. But hey-ho. <laughs> hey-ho. <laughs> yeah, that was good. It was a frustrating case. But again, if there are any cases that you would like us to look into, please let us know. And on that note, mm. dear mung beans, we bid you adieu. Goodbye. Bye.